Welcome back to another episode of Shaping E-Commerce with Iron Plane. I'm Tim Bucciarelli, Director of Engagement at Iron Plane. And today we are joined by Robert Giovannini, CEO of Iron Plane. So, Bob, thank you for joining me today. Tim, thanks for having me. Great to have you on. And uh, I know that we have a lot of these conversations in our day to day about the future of e-commerce, our role in the future of e-commerce. But, you know, the target for this recording is merchants who have these questions and, you know, are just wanting to understand what should they be looking at in e-commerce, not just today, but also in the next five to 10 years so that they can get the biggest return on the investment decisions that they make. So the first question is really at a very high level. Where do you see e-commerce going generally in the next five to 10 years? Wow, you know, it, those are the impossible questions, right? You know, very high level and I, and I love it because it's, it's a great thought exercise. If you're a merchant today, it's almost harder because there's so many options to consider and you want to try to get it right. And I mean, you know, from a lot of the meetings we have with clients, we'll sit down and go, hey, we're not thinking out 10 years a lot of times. We're, you know, best case, if you can be thinking out three years and have a roadmap, this is probably uh, a real win in your organization because the idea that you're going to be on the same technology without a significant investment, again, within five years, not likely unless things are very static and not complex in your organization. And of course, there are the exceptions to this rule. We still have clients on Magento One, for example, you know, years after its, you know, end of life. So uh, when you ask this question, you know, where do I see it going in the next five to 10 years? I, I kind of look back. I look back to when I started in this, you know, 1998-ish, I think it was, I was in Russia. E-commerce was new. Amazon was doing its thing. It, couple years now, but as an individual, you could get into this, you could build a website and it wasn't just HTML anymore. And heaven knows I'm not a coder. So it was not, a, you know, I needed tools and there was a tool at the time called front page. And this seemed to be all the rage and it was a way to drag and drop and build a website and you could wire up PayPal. Okay. This is pretty cool. So I'm in Russia and I'm at this market on one weekend and I find these chess sets that look absolutely amazing. And I said, okay. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get into e-commerce. How hard can this be? And so I buy some of these chess sets and some of them were pretty expensive. And I took some pictures on an old first round Kodak digital camera at the time. And, and I uploaded this thing and there's no such thing as a security certificate, at least that I knew of at the time. And, and I let it ride. And I think I forgot about it for a few days, came back, you know, some days later and I had an email saying your chess set has sold and it's some ski slope in Western Canada has bought it sight unseen for, and I don't know, it was a few thousand bucks, right? Whatever it was, I'm going, holy moly, sight unseen. So you put a credit card on there and now I got to ship this product, of course. And that was e-commerce, you know, and, and that was the beginning. And, you know, now we're going back, you know, over 20 years and that's a significant change from where that was to where we are today. Now, as significant as that change has been, it's also the same. We're taking a product, taking a picture of it, putting it up on a website and hoping somebody buys it. And there and, are for, for, for some people, similarly simple tools and even simpler tools to build a website. You can build a website in three hours and sure. get ready to sell stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, it's gotten easier. So, you know, I, I guess the point being, you know, where's it going to be in five to 10 years? I, I think it's going to be in some ways, a lot more of the same. It's going to be, I've got this platform. I have this way to talk to the world, show my product and get them up there. Now to get a little more technical, I think this idea of e-commerce, maybe in five to 10 years, it won't be e-commerce anymore. That'll feel like a, an anachronism. It'll just be commerce. You know, we went through this whole period of, you know, is it a big E, a little E, E dash commerce? What is it? Right. And now, you know, I really think that as we talk about these ideas of universal commerce and composable commerce and all these other things, which are born of technical solutions, but really they're getting to the crux of the issue, which is companies that are starting to see a unification across all their channels and it just becomes commerce. And depending on where you are in that spectrum, will determine maybe what tool sets make the most sense for you and how integrated or not. 
So I like that. And, and I think commerce may be too generic a term. I, people like to give qualifiers. So, sure. but I think you use the term unified and I think unified or integrated commerce. I think that's really accurate. So we're going back to e-commerce is what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know. Or you commerce you commerce that has a little yeah. bit more of a ring to it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's so that. I think I like, I like that idea. And it, you can see kind of the indicators right now with buy online, pick up and store, for example, local delivery. Certainly, you're always going to have the e-commerce pure plays. You can only buy their stuff online and that's it. There's no brick and mortar. But I think for businesses who are in the real world of dealing with people in a brick and mortar environment or a B2B sales team environment, finding ways to better integrate those systems into one commerce platform that I think that's a great vision of the future of e-commerce and how it can be better, I'd say. Well, even four years ago, we were talking about, you know, 360 degree view of a customer, right? And it was the dream that, you know, if somebody was in your retail store, they could start there, finish up online, start online, finish up their mobile, right? All these were separate channels in many respects. And the dream was, could you have one unified view of that customer across all those channels? And the solutions, I mean, yes, you could make it happen, but it was never easy. Right. It still was elusive for most even larger complex companies to pull that off. But it's almost happening naturally, right? And this is where we're getting to this, you know, unified commerce where the ability to, to see your customer across these channels and provide different ways to serve them where they are and how they want to be served is getting easier. And and it's changing fairly rapidly. I mean, you just brought up the whole buy, buy online and pick up in store. You know, two years ago or pre-pandemic, Amazon with their prime two-day delivery and three dollars and ninety-nine cents for next day delivery, you thought, who's ever going to compete with this? How is that ever going to? How will you, as a merchant, ever be on the same footing as Amazon in this case? But whether it was pandemic or just they were tired of losing money, but we're up here in Portland, Maine, we can no longer, even with Prime, get something delivered in two days. Oh, you can if you order on a Tuesday because Thursday seems to be the main day that they deliver things up to Portland, Maine. Okay. And so, and there is no such thing as next day delivery. And then I noticed all of a sudden, I think this was during the pandemic, I got online and I hadn't bought from Best Buy in I don't know how many years and I needed a product and it popped up. And not only did I see that the local inventory was fully synced, at least in theory, with all the local stores, beyond that, I can not only pick up in store within three hours, but they said if I ordered by 3 p.m., they would deliver it to my door by 6 p.m. that day at no extra cost. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, who would have thought, right? This older school, you know, brick and mortar, electronics retailer, and they won my business and the price was comparable. I mean, I don't know, it was within a few dollars. It wasn't enough to make a difference, but I got served that day and I didn't have to get in my car and go. And so yeah, I think that, you know, with the tools and the way things are coming around, this ability to serve the customer and distinguish yourself in your markets is, is getting really interesting. So I want to touch on this idea of integration and unification a little bit later in the conversation, but kind of getting to brass tacks now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the platforms that are out there. And just if you can give us a sense of like, again, I know that there's so much overlap between these platforms, but if you could give us your opinion of the platforms and kind of their primary use cases so that merchants might feel like, oh, I fit in this bucket and I should be considering you know, this platform or that platform, if there are distinguishing features enough for that. It, it's definitely getting, the overlap is getting bigger and bigger as you would expect, right? What we consider to be the, the traditional SaaS type solutions where you, you've you got a box of a whole bunch of tools that are supported and updated and everybody can share in your, your Shopify's and your big commerce. I think both of these are fantastic tools for a lot of merchants and manufacturers. And again, it depends on the level of complexity in your organization, not the size, but complexity. And I think a solution like Shopify, if you are not overly complex, 
And what does that mean? It means the level of integrations, com customizations. Are you international? And not that you can't do these things, but right, if you're just thinking- It could be volume of sales or, you know- be, yeah. Exactly, yeah. right? Are you uh, are you exceeding their API limits? I mean, who, who the heck knows, right? I mean, it, it's any number of technical final details, but broad strokes, I think Shopify is really a great solution for people whose needs are not extraordinarily complex and they can fit in their box and they're going to do very well. And they're probably the total cost of ownership will be better there than things that are more complex if you can fit in that box. I think big commerce is that next level. And we hear this theme a lot now, you know, where big commerce seems to be just that middle player between a true SaaS and maybe something that is more custom or platform as a service, which is a really bizarre, you know, nuance that we're getting into, right? And so we've as a company have chosen big commerce as our second platform that we've gone all in on and that we think is the right solution for the kinds of clients we serve that have more complex needs that have the need for integration that go beyond run-of-the-mill integrations and want the platform to be able to scale and do things that you can't predict today maybe and so you want to you want to be on something that can grow with your changing needs that are not always known, you know, three years in advance. And so this is where I think big commerce is a good play. Magento is our darling. I mean, Magento, you know, for I always tell people this, for all of its strengths and weaknesses and everything else in between, it has and still continues to be, I think, a really good solution for a lot of companies. I think that when I look at Magento, whether you're B2C or B2B, the ability to scale, the ability to customize, the ability to make it your own sets it apart. And costs still, whether you're talking their, their enterprise edition, your commerce cloud, or you're talking open source, total cost of ownership probably still comes out ahead if you're comparing apples to apples and you're leveraging that tool to its fullest. So I think that that is how I see those platforms. You certainly have another whole scale of what are maybe established brand names in the enterprise space like Salesforce, even SAP. These tools have their place. I, I think that they were, you know, just like WooCommerce on the opposite extreme was born out of a content management system. And again, it can work for certain applications. It feels to me, you know, it's it, the e-commerce part of it is never its core. It's a content management system that bolted on e-commerce. Salesforce is a CRM system, that, and it's not fair to say they bolted on e-commerce. It is far more substantial than that today, but that's the genesis, right? And so I think that that's where your e-commerce specific platforms like a Magento, while never will be a phenomenal CMS content management system, do e-commerce very, very well. Yeah, and these platforms, when we're talking about the unification, each of them have their own flavor of that unification. I think Shopify has gone the path, like you said, of creating this ecosystem, the Shopify ecosystem. And if you're comfortable with that, that is very unified. They've got their point of sale. They've got their payments processing. They've got their marketing platforms. And then you've got big commerce, which is really letting you kind of connect the dots with their, what they call their open SaaS. And then you've got like, like you described Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, but then there's also like the SAP, the Oracle, like the NetSuite, like these are, again, similar to how you describe Salesforce being born out of CRM. Those are born out of kind of more the, I don't know, like the ERP financial, you know, like the back office operation stuff. And it said, okay, well, let's do e-commerce now. It's like, people are always trying to integrate things, but t totally different flavors. And, uh, I also agree. I like where we landed with Magento and Big Commerce. It allows the merchant a little bit more flexibility to kind of pick and choose the best in class technologies that they want to unify with their e-commerce platform, which is very purpose built. So, okay, that's great. That gives us a, a broad view of the e-commerce platforms out there. What do you think about marketplaces? and? When I say marketplaces, to me, I think of course, Amazon, which is a huge marketplace, but in, in marketplace, people think Amazon sells just all their own inventory, but obviously they don't. They sell other merchants inventories that's managed by the merchants. They manage it themselves. It's all over the place. It is a true 
marketplace. Walmart is doing the same thing. And Shopify, interestingly, is getting into that space as well with Shopify Marketplace, which is a little bit of a different approach, but it is totally a marketplace. Same same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Where where are these marketplaces gonna fit? I mean, are they gonna kind of gobble everything up and eat away everyone's margin, or is there gonna be some reaction against them? It's so interesting, this discussion. For me, I've always thought that marketplaces were a natural extension of any sales strategy. I mean, why wouldn't you put your products into the marketplaces? Yes, it gobbles up some margin, although depending on who you are, the margin is may not be any more than it is to acquire your own customer. There are pluses and minuses, which we can get into. But to this day, I am shocked at the number of e-commerce companies that are not on market that start off by having their own e-commerce website and whether they're pure plays or you know they're multi-channel but don't sell in the marketplaces whether because they they have this natural visceral reaction against the amazons of the world or just because they don't understand it or because it seems like they feel like they're going to cut their own business you know they're competing against themselves and on the flip side if you talk to some of the major marketplace sellers, and, and these are, I mean, some of these are consolidating into billion dollar companies. These are not small players. They'll tell you, you know, oh, I know I should create my own e-commerce site. And they don't. I was on a podcast earlier this summer and it was a gentleman who their whole podcast is based on marketplaces. This is, that's their entire universe is marketplaces. And we were both talking about this issue. He's like, and he consults with marketplace businesses. He said, none, they all know they need to create an e-commerce site and they don't. So do I think they're going to gobble up or, or be a direct competitor? I think no. I think, well, yes, direct comp competition, maybe, but gobble up, no. I think that if I'm an e-commerce business and either pure play or multi-channel, but not in the marketplaces, I would be leveraging my product data set and getting it into these marketplaces. I think it allows you to re get your brand out there in a way that you can't do on your own. I think it's like being in the mall. And why wouldn't you be there, particularly if they're catering to segments and markets that you're not touching at all? You've got a chance of extending your brand, bringing people into your universe. Certainly, if you do your own fulfillment, you've even got more control over that. Uh, I think it's a natural extension of any sales and marketing strategy. And I think it allows you to get into maybe even international markets easier than you could otherwise. So, yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. I think that there are some reasons why e commerce merchants may not be kind of aware of how to get into the marketplaces mm -hmm. effectively. So I think that might be a good topic for us to dive into a little bit more on another episode of Shaping E-Commerce. I, I like the idea of really digging into that to expose how merchants can very easily get onto these marketplaces and kind of how to implement a, a smart strategy rather than just, you know, doing it and see what happens. So conversation yeah. for another time. Yeah, yeah, but it's good. It's a tremendous opportunity for most clients, though. I, I think that they are missing, they have the, the information, the data. This is really one of those, I think, a great way for a merchant to increase sales yeah. very quickly. So, Okay, so we're going to shift gears here a little bit, and we're going to dive into our primary platform of focus at Ironplane, and that is Magento Open Source and Adobe Commerce. You, better than anyone, know the history of Magento and the many hands that have been involved in that platform, not just the community, but from eBay to Adobe to, <laughs> right? So yeah. there are questions these days and a little bit of confusion that people have of the difference between Magento, Magento Open Source, Magento Enterprise Edition, Adobe Commerce, Adobe Commerce Cloud. Can you give us kind of the breakdown of where they stand today? And more importantly, what are they going to look like in, let's say, three years, not even five to ten? I'm looking forward to when we interview one of my partners, Kuba, because he's been a Magento master. He's a true developer who's been in the community at a level that we never even were in at all. And I think it's going to be really interesting to hear his thoughts and feelings about this. My own personal feelings, I think that if I'm Adobe, I was looking to see if 
Magento open source was a lead generation, was an entree to selling my commerce cloud. Was a natural, you know, do people outgrow the open source edition and move in? And is this a great way to be in that world? My guess is the answer is no, or they found that, you know, because we see it. Once you start building an open source, you realize, A, you can do just about every single thing you're going to do in a licensed enterprise version of it. The community is very active even today and solutions abound. And so you can typically get to where you need to get to with actually some more flexibility because that's the beauty of this kind of platform. You are not hampered by the box that if you're going to go into a commerce cloud, you know, version there's going to be just a little more, there's going to be more guardrails or have to be. And so again, for certain companies that understand software development and understand total cost of ownership, this still ends up being probably a better solution because they can continue to innovate and make it their own. The Magento uh, open source. Yeah, the Magento open source. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, you know, it's very rare when we've seen somebody go from open source to enterprise, even when it used to be called that, right? And today we don't see it very often either. In fact, if anything, we see people saying, hey, do I need to be on this? Even complex companies and larger companies. And it comes down to, again, some of the differences are, you know, do you not want to manage your DevOps, right? Do you like having the security of Adobe, making sure that your core is secure and scalable and they're watching all those pieces? Or are you a company that likes to tinker and you want to get in and make it your own and want to manage that? I think that's where the distinction is. And uh, my own philosophy has always been, and, and this is, you know, as much as I love big commerce, and I think also Shopify is a great solution for a lot of people, I always caution putting my business in somebody else's hands. And because, you know, yes, it's nice, they're going to take care of these things. But if I'm growing at a decent clip each year and I have a complex website, I'm beholden, I'm renting space. I am leasing from this group over here. And if that group just happens to either have financial issues or takes a strategic turn technologically, I'm at their whim at that point. And depending on how complex my e-commerce business is, that can be very risky. It's, it's like owning a restaurant. It's like starting your first restaurant and it's wildly successful. And the landlord goes, ah, I'm going to, I'm going to triple your rent because you don't own the building. And you're like, well, wait a minute, I, I can't afford that. And I can't move because it, half of my success comes from my location. Right. And so you, you built in somebody else's backyard and that always makes me nervous. Now, when we, when we talk to clients, we say, you know, look, if you can plan for that, you know, how hard is it to move off of a SaaS tool? How much would it take you to move from A to B? And if you've got that risk analysis done and you've got your backup plans in place, much less of an issue, of course. But, Migration is always possible, but the yes. more comprehensive the box that you're in, often the more challenging it is to do that migration to a different platform. So Yeah, you're, you're not talking a month, right? You could be talking a year or two. Right. I mean, even some larger companies that have, you know, 50 products and maybe you're doing $50 million a year, but they're very simple products. You're like, oh, I can just copy and paste my, my 15 products over to here. Yes, I've got, you got, you know, four subscriptions you sell and no complex interdependencies. Great. But you could be a company that's only doing two, three, four million dollars a year. Well, not only it's substantial, but if you've got your ERP system connected in and it's driving complex pricing so that when the customer comes and they're configuring these complex, let's say pieces of furniture, and you've got to have all this pricing dynamic and it's built on, you know, a custom integration with your ERP system and multi-channel, multi-warehouse inventory. And on top of all of that, you're showing what 3D renderings. Right. you know, of the product on top of it. And that's got to fit into the platform. Good luck moving all that. Uh, yeah, I, you're yeah. not going to do it in, in 30 days, you know, and you probably spent two years getting to where you are now. And so that's where I, you know, when we're analyzing and somebody says, hey, should I be on a SaaS or should I build custom or something in between platform as a service which is sort of in the middle of that, I guess. These are the kinds of questions I want to answer. Yeah, so we talk about kind of the future of e-commerce on this, but maybe it's actually the merchants themselves should be thinking about what's the future of my business? And working from there, think about where where I'm going to be in 10 years and what platform is more likely to support me that entire way 
and continue to support me even in year 10 where maybe I don't have to feel like I need to jump to another platform. I like that framing, I, th I think, a little bit more. I think so too. I, I like it a lot. I mean, this is why, you know, even today we've got Magento One Merchants, right? I mean, they are still leveraging that platform and able to do it because there's such a substantial community around it, because it was so customizable. For them, this is working. I mean, they're getting a lot of return on that investment. Now, at some point, you know, like anything, it, it'll be harder and harder to do that. But that's, that's an interesting analysis I think any company needs to go through. Yeah, and that gets to the question of SaaS versus on-prem or PaaS, whatever you want to call it. But there is there is a dividing line. You're either subscribed to a centralized service like SaaS, right? Shopify, big commerce, where you're paying a fee every month to rent the pipes that they provide to you and the functionality. The other is this kind of what is called on-prem or could be maybe platform as a service, but let's call it on-prem. On-premises, it's hosted somewhere else. It's your site that you control. You're not, you might pay a licensing fee, but let's talk Magento open source, no licensing fee, but you have a degree of support. So you pay an agency like Ironplane monthly support to keep your website up to date, compliant, accessible, running smoothly. You also pay hosting. So that's kind of what I've always seen as the split. Like on the one hand, you got these subscription fees. On the other hand, you got the support and hosting. You got to balance it out over time. Look at your six year total cost of ownership and see what wins. But generally those are the kind of primary cost distinctions I think of. Do you see one kind of winning out over the other in the coming years, SaaS versus on-prem, or is it just, they're just serving different needs and will always? That's a good question. Do I see one winning out? I think the platforms, uh, your SaaS platforms will continue to improve. They'll continue to add more features and functions. It's a natural evolution. And that box will start to encompass the needs of more and more businesses as a whole. But the the one business that needs something out of the box to stand out in their market or just in the nature of how their business operates, and they need those things that the SaaS can't provide, because that would be the exception to the rule, this is where your what we're calling either on-prem maybe pass, maybe uh, full custom, right? It depends on what you're doing. This is where those will probably become more useful to those people and easier to do and customize. But certainly the total cost of ownership will either be the same or more going down that path, but you should be getting the requisite value out of those. Maybe the easiest way to answer this is just thinking back a little bit, five years ago, somebody will call up and, you know, maybe a smaller or merchant or just starting out in e-commerce or maybe, you know, only doing a few million dollars a year, a couple million dollars a year. We could say Magento was a legitimate solution for you. You know, even with your simple SKUs that have no interdependencies, no integrations, right? Magento, look, we can get you up and running here. You can have a website running for five, ten thousand dollars and ah, yeah, you know, you're gonna have some security patches and things, but you know, probably five hours a month on average to keep it running smoothly. Today, right, somebody calls up you know, as much as we love Magento, unless you know going in that you've got to allocate 20, 30 hours a month just to sort of keep it humming along, right? And that's, this is a real broad strokes, right? It depends, you know, if you're far more complex, it'd be a lot more than that, right? So uh, it's very rare when we talk to a startup or a somebody new to e-commerce and say Magento is the right solution from a pure business perspective. And I'm not sure there's too many other solutions out there anymore that I would point to. I mean, I know we talk about shopware in Europe is growing and it's got good reputation and devs like the code base. But, you know, one of our big things when we're talking as an agency is, you know, is there a community behind the solution you're going for? And if there isn't, and you're not particularly technical in your own organization, this is more experimental for you than we would typically recommend. But if you are well verse and you have IT departments and these things, okay, well, Shopware might be a solution we would suggest in those cases. I don't think there's, we don't have something yet that replaces where Magento was at the time. And I'm not sure we need to, because, and this gets to your question, you know, which one's going to win out? I think the Shopify's and the big commerces have real, big commerces, I'm not even sure that's the word, you know, big commerce websites 
of the world have, you know, come forward with such a good base solution that it accomplishes a lot of what a smaller Magento site used to do with yeah. all the ability to customize. So, yep. uh, and it's going to be interesting also to see which of these platforms are more suited to the B2B businesses, because a lot of B2B businesses still have what I would call brochure websites, and they might have a lot of product data. They might have a lot of PDFs, but at the end of the day, a lot of those B2B sites still, maybe they allow quotes, but they do not really fully allow their website to support their sales process. They don't process transactions. They don't process purchase orders. They don't offer pricing on a customer by customer basis on their website. So I think when B2B, which I think naturally is a more complicated system with more applications that need to be tied together, like that to me is like, it just screams Magento, like you need something with that type of flexibility. I mean, you could probably do it maybe with big commerce. It's worth looking at because they have a pretty substantial B2B functionality out of the box, their B2B edition, they call it. But I think when you look at the level of integrations that you need, I think for the B2B, it seems like Magento open source, Adobe commerce, and those bigger platforms are going to be more likely to fit the need. Well, there were the B2C was some years ago, right? In terms of they need that extensibility. They need that customization. They need that level of integration that you're not going to get out of the box. Otherwise you're going to be shoehorning in and, and that always has its own issues. And so I, I fully agree with you. I think in the B2B space, I mean, in some ways it's been the Holy grail for years. People keep talking about, you know, B2B is the right. next digital transformation. And, yeah, exactly. Digital <laughs> transformation. Um, but it's happening and it's happening naturally. And this is where, you know, we started this whole conversation about, you know, where's e-commerce going in five to 10 years. And, and you know, we have to joke that it's just gonna be commerce, right? Well, I, I think that this is what we're seeing in the B2B space for them. It's commerce, their vendors and their distributors and their reps are all starting to demand these extra tools now to help make it easier to sell. And I think that's driving, we're seeing this, you know, where B2B companies that have been uh, far more traditional, still are, you know, operating legacy ERP systems are saying, we want to be in this space. How do we bridge this? How do we get there? And it typically is something Magento based or custom, one of the two. Yep. And so, and there are certainly B2B dedicated platforms out there that really try to tackle this very, very specifically. But that's a little bit like we were talking about earlier, they're born out of trying to solve one problem and have not looked at the whole idea of e-commerce and they may be um, industry specific they may depend on one primary integration to a manufacturer erp system and oms you yes. know so you may again be in a box which which yes. could work really well for you yes but it is another type of box i guess now yeah. an, another area that companies come to us and they often are saying well you know i want to go headless <laughs> so what what is this like i know we both know but for well do audience, we know i mean you know, I, I, yeah i've got I a pretty good sense i at yeah. this point i've, yeah. I've got a pretty good yeah, sense we, we, headless we, composable it is very trendy it is very top of mind in the e-commerce technology world right now and companies who keep their finger on the pulse of e-commerce technology are wondering what is it is it for me and is it going to help me build my business? You know, you and I always start the conversation with the last question when we're talking to clients because we're not coders, right? We didn't start this agency as coders. We didn't come into it from that perspective. And so I came in from buying and selling e-commerce websites and, and growing e-commerce. So my question is always, is it going to grow my business or cost me less somehow to run my business, right? So. The general answer with headless, at least up until recently, was probably not going to do either one of those for you. It was very rare in the last few years where we would go, oh, you've got to be on a headless solution. I mean, you are just, this is the right thing. There have been those moments, but those are also companies that 
they wanted to be on Magento, let's say, and I would call it Amino, Magento and name only, right? At the end of the day, by the time you were done customizing it and setting up all your microservices and doing everything you needed to do to connect to their internal systems and they had their headless custom front end, Magento was like barely there. So in those cases, headless did make sense as an option, even in those early days. And I love the tools that have come out recently. Our partners like Shogun and others that we, we work with and view. I, these are great tool sets, but they're still, relatively speaking, complex solutions that take more investment and a willingness by the company to not only learn those tools, but continue to invest in those tools to keep current. So I think in the world of composable commerce and complex integrations and multi-channel, Headless is probably a really good solution for those kinds of companies because it gives you that massive flexibility and it separates your back end from your front end, basically, right? And so you're not coupled and, and tied so that this whole idea of scalability and flexibility over a three to 10 year period would seem to be stronger in that scenario. Does the total cost of ownership add up? That's the business analysis that we typically have to go client by client to say, what is it you're going to get out of this? What's going to be the cost to maintain it? And what do you think that, you know, your advantages are going to be over this period of time? And that's the analysis. Yeah. And I think that speaks to kind of the one overarching recommendation I always make to a merchant who's considering e-commerce, their next play in e-commerce. And, you know, it's really find an agency who has sufficient experience in the world of e-commerce and the multiple platforms available and who can understand your business and help guide you in making your decision. Because going with the latest trendy thing could be a big mistake. Living within a box today might work, but three, four years down the road, maybe it won't. And merchants may have everyone on their team to be able to make those decisions strategically. But it's always, in my opinion, a good idea to sign on with an agency just to help you figure that out. I mean, that's what we love doing at Ironplane in our initial conversations, whether we end up working with the client or not, hopefully we will, but we enjoy having those conversations and helping guide people to the right platform. It raises our level too. I mean, if we come through a discovery with a client or an analysis with a client, and we don't think that Big Commerce or Magento is the proper solution for them, we will tell them because, well, A, it, it'd be a nightmare if we, you know, tell a client right. and then it'll work out and that's yeah. never pleasant. And so, you know, they don't like us, we don't like them. And, you know, it's never worth the, the, the contract for that. But more importantly, we learn their nuances and can steer them, put them in, you know, hey, look at these technologies over here. We think this is going to be a better fit for you, but it helps us to better understand what's going on in the market also. And as we make our decisions about where we're investing, and so that's always, it's good. It, it raises everybody's level. You know, Iron Plane, the, the name came because I, I'm a woodworker and, and I love tools, okay? And as a woodworker, Tim, you can, it, 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 it's a veritable toy store, right? I mean, for, for an adult, you go in and, and there's just tools and tools and tools and, and everything from the, you know, brand names that everybody knows to the most esoteric little thing out there that's complex and is going to do this one thing. There's a lot of overlap with e-commerce systems and technologies. I mean, the, the analogy, you could take it pretty far. And I never thought as a woodworker that I would like hand tools. I thought, ah, oh, no way. I, I want giant table saws and routers and band saws. If you look at my basement, it's filled with, you know, these fancy big machines. And then at one point, I don't know, I'm sure I must have told you the story at some point, but at one point I was building a piece of furniture and I had spent hours and hours on this one particular joint to bring it together. And it, and I was like, and no one was going to notice. I mean, this was just me. This was just down to these final details, right? And I didn't have anything that I felt I could bring it together. And not far from here up north, there's a company called Lee Nielsen, who happens to be on a Magento site, by the way, that we did not build. But Lee Nielsen manufactures some of the finest high-end hand planes in the country, in the world. So, you know, it was an excuse on a Saturday to go up to another tool store. And I walked in with this idea that I'm going to buy one hand plane. And of course, you walk out with four. And I came down and I, and I took that tool. And it was sharp out of the box. So, you know, worked out of the box, which is nice. And I took it to the, to the P's. A, it was quiet. Okay. I didn't have to wear hearing protection. I didn't have to wear a mask. This is pre-pandemic, so it's kind of a new thing. And it just went, and it took off a sh shaving and the joint came together perfectly, right? 
And I was sold. I'm like, oh my God, this is this is in my toolkit. This is going to be a tool I use regularly going forward. And as you know, when we had to come up with a name for this company, other than you know what was a really nondescript bad name for many, many years, I was thinking about like, okay, you know what I love is helping clients find the right tools. Really, when I'm sitting down and we're gonna talk to a client tomorrow, a potential client tomorrow, and they're on, I think, WooCommerce, they're a well-established company. 50 year company and you know decent size and so this is one of those examples they're on a very simple platform and their question is do we double down on this or do we need to change platforms and and obviously if they stay on woocommerce it's not going to be a client of ours but i said i don't know we need to talk about your business what what do you want this to do and what do you see it's it's rolling your organization over the next five to 10 years? And is it that you're trying to unify your B2B channels or are you just going direct to consumer in some markets? Or are you, is this just a catalog for you? You know, and so all of those things will determine what tools make the most sense. And I think, you know, just to round this out, you, you said earlier in this conversation, a company might have all the people in their organization that can help decide the right platform. And part of what we do when we're talking to people is saying, hey, who are all the stakeholders in your website? Who is everyone that interacts with that website? Because we might hear from a marketing person who's found us and says, hey, we want to talk to you about either taking over or building or doing something. And the first question is, okay, but who else is involved? Not that we want to get higher or lower in your organization to try to get a sign up, but it's because there are expectations across the organization that are different than your perspective. And we can help draw those out. The CFO wants to know that they don't have to recreate orders in their system. It's got to go from ERP to this, to that, to the next. The CEO is maybe thinking about brand and messaging overall and doesn't want to step on their distributors' toes over here. And so they got to make sure that they're covering that, right? Customer good, service. Yeah, customer service. That was going to be tough. You know, yeah. Oh, it's always, right? They got to be able to find the orders or they got a call center coming in. And, you know, all of these things to your end consumer, those are the people that all need to have a say. And you've got to rank that analysis because you can't do everything, but you got to know what is mission critical across all those departments. Because if you don't take that into account, this is where we see companies run into trouble because yep. they have something they put a lot of money into that maybe looks beautiful but doesn't solve half the issues that the company was hoping it would solve, or maybe solves half the issues operationally, but doesn't convey the brand in any meaningful way, right? And so there's always these kinds of questions that come up. Yeah, so. yep. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation, which is great. Hopefully merchants listening will find some value here. I have one final question. Is there anything out there today that you look at and you're like, it's kind of like that one tool you know, particularly innovative e-commerce platform, service, tool, anything out there today that even two or three of them, if you want, that really strikes you as like, wow, that's like that plane that you found. Or the table saw that auto stops when your finger touches. It. Yes, um, that that's. I love, I love, I love my yes, stop. Big fan of <laughs> so, safety in the wood shop. <laughs> exactly. Listen, we always see those new tools come up and every tool looks cool. And you're like, oh, that's gonna transform my business. It's been very rare when a single tool or series of tools have single-handedly transform somebody's e-commerce website. So I think what I like and where I see businesses where I think they should focus their efforts is how can you make your products stand out for the consumer, whether that's through good education, through content, through authority and validation, like our furniture company, right? With their 3D renderings. And now you can picture every single color and every single wood finish on their website. I think that that's where the tools that I, I really like, the ones that make it easier for you to merchandise your products in a unique way. Because I still, I'm, I'm amazed at the sheer number of websites I'll go to and basic images are poor, right? And so, I, so to me, I don't think we have to look for this grand thing. I think making it so that people can find your product and understand your product and trust your product, these kinds of merchandising tools are gonna go a long way. That to me is one. If you want to get really you know, fun, things like augmented reality are definitely coming about. They're coming in, right? Does this apply to every single product? No, but for products where people want to visualize how this might look in their own home, 
I like it. And, you know, and whether that's clothes in a dressing room and we're seeing those in the magic changing rooms or you're in a furniture retail store and you can visualize this furniture, the sales rep pulls up the manufacturer's augmented reality of all the furniture and now you can see it in your home. I, I think these are tools that are not extremely hard to implement. I mean, they're not turnkey, but they're not extremely hard to implement and, and can really carry your brand to the next level and differentiate yourself. So I like those things. What do you think about personalization and AI? It's going to happen one way or the other. I, I mean, I think that personalization and AI are going to be baked in at some point, almost like search is baked in across platforms and everything else. So yes, I think that you can get real specific. I think there are industry specific. I think there are technology specific solutions. I think that you can uh, latch onto those. Some of them are software as a service. Some of them are you set up your own on-prem solution. But I think that personalization is one of those things and product recommendations, all that. People have been chomping at it for a while now. There have been good solutions and mediocre solutions, but I just think that we're going to see that almost baked in and standardized is my, this is my prediction yeah, over okay. the next five years. Good. So I like the focus on the merchandising of your products, like bringing it back to your core offering and distinguishing yourself through your core offering, the best presentation, most effective merchandising of your core offering. I like that. I, I, I think so. And I think it's something you can control. I mean, that's the beauty, right? If you're a merchant or a manufacturer, you know your product better than anybody else. I would leverage that asset and that's what will distinguish you. Yep, great. Well, that's a wrap. We finished all of our questions. I appreciate you taking the time, Bob. We'll have many more conversations, I'm sure, both recorded and not. But I thank you for taking the time today to talk with us on Shaping E-Commerce. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. All right. Take care.